We are in the midst of a sermon series on the book of Acts, and we have just seen Acts 11, 1 through 30, reenacted for us. And in, in thinking about this passage, there's a whole lot of information here that I want to cover, but we've talked about how the book of Acts is kind of a transitionary period. It's from Jesus to the start of the church and what the church looks like as it develops. And Acts talks about how the church develops. And then the New Testament letters go on to further explain how the church has developed and how its officers came about and and the way it functions and all of that. And we begin to see some of that transition in a very serious way here when we look at Acts 11. And what I want to talk about this morning then is the church at work, because I think there's some very important lessons for us to learn as believers and as a church as to how we are supposed to work and function as a result of this passage. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you so much for what you have done for us through Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can be here to look at your word and I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you will help us to understand your message, that you will help me to proclaim it, and that we will go from this place better knowing how we are supposed to be as people, how we are supposed to be as your church. And dear Lord, I pray if there's anyone here struggling to know you are struggling in their relationship with you, that through the power of your word and through the power of your spirit, you will reveal yourself to them, even as I pray you will help all of us to become closer to you as a result of being here today. And it's in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, it's probably fair to warn you that um, we have a lot of slides to get through, and not only have I had caffeine, I have also eaten a lot of candy corn. So we may be going very quickly this morning. But anyway, for the first section of our scripture, we see that Jerusalem affirms the universality of the gospel. We've been talking about that, right? The gospel is for everyone. Well, That's a lesson that they're going to have to learn, just as we saw Peter learn it, or I should say God taught it to Peter by giving him a vision. And we see right off the bat, though, in this passage, that conflict will come in the church. I wish it didn't. I wish it wouldn't. But it started at the very beginning of the church, and it continues to this day. Uh, Acts 11, 2 and 3, so when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. So these were those within the church now who believed, but they also wanted to enforce the law and say, okay, sure, believe in Jesus Christ, but you have to keep the law too and do all of the things of the law, including being circumcised. So they, they were saying, hey, wait a minute, what are you doing eating with a Gentile? What are you doing talking to a Gentile? What are you doing sharing with a Gentile, someone who is non-Jewish? Because the church primarily up to this point has been composed, composed of converted Jewish people. And this isn't the first incident we see in the book of Acts. We covered one in Acts 6.1. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Another problem. Things happen. People get upset. People complain. And years later, Paul writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1.11, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there's quarreling among you, my brothers. Problems come in churches. Complaints come in churches. And we see, though, that discussion and discernment are important in dissension. Acts 11.4, but Peter began and explained it to them in order. He said, okay, wait a minute. Before you get all upset with me, let me give you the whole story so you can understand what happened, and then we can discuss it. Then you can decide if I did something wrong or not. And we see something very similar in Acts 2, or 6, 2, and 3, when the issue arose with the widow's daily distribution, and the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Discussion and discernment. Figuring out what God was doing, figuring out how they should go about it, 
working with one another. That is always the way to handle conflict in the church. And we also are reminded of a lesson that we've talked about repeatedly as we go through this, that God is at work to accomplish his purpose in the world. And that's why it's so important that, that Peter said, well, God showed me this, to let them know that, hey, this is God doing this. This is not my idea. This is not something I thought up. This is something that God revealed to me. And he even revealed what happened with Cornelius. Acts 11.9, he says, But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. That was God talking to Peter, showing him through the food that everyone and everything he created was good. And then with Cornelius, Acts 11, 13 uh, and 14. And he told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and say... Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and your household. Now, this is especially neat this morning to to look at this again, because, you know, we have a tendency sometimes, particularly in the United States of America, and probably particularly as Baptists, to wonder about certain things and certain reports we get back from the mission field. And a little bit of healthy skepticism is not the worst thing, as we're going to see in a moment. However, what does this sound like? Cornelius has a dream, and he sends for Peter because God wants to reveal the gospel to him. Now, we might say, well, why wouldn't God just reveal it to him? Why do it this way? And we could get into why God would, but God did Doesn't this kind of sound like the Jesus dream? It's kind of interesting, isn't it? The parallels we see there. This is what happened to Cornelius. God didn't say, oh, believe in Jesus Christ. He said, go and send for this person who will come and talk to you about Jesus Christ. That's pretty neat to see that God is using the same methods that he did then, now. And, you know, it's it's interesting when we we think about God being at work. We spent some time in the book of Esther. And um, I think about it now particularly because um, of some devotional thoughts I've written about in the last uh, few days, in in a week or so. But anyway, if we go back to Esther um, 4.14, you know, this is Mordecai speaking to Esther. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And we know she had. And she did what she needed to do to help her people to survive. But the wonderful thing about Esther is, God isn't mentioned in the book, but he's through the whole book. It just happens. These things just happen over and over and over again. If they didn't happen in the exact order they did at the time they did, the Jews could have been all killed in the empire. But God was at work behind the scenes, and we understand that God is at work. Sometimes it's overt, as we see here with Peter getting a vision, Cornelius getting a dream, having an angel talk to him, and sometimes it is behind the scenes, but God is at work, and God keeps his promises. This this is, I hope, an interesting take on what we've read here, uh, and what we've heard here. But in Acts 11, 17, Peter says, "If, if then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? And basically he's saying, you know, you're wondering, you know, would God reach out to the Gentiles? I'm saying he did because the same gift he gave to us through the Spirit he gave to them. And that is God doing what he said he would do from the very beginning. This shouldn't have been a surprise, even though it was to the Jewish people. It shouldn't have been a surprise. But God granted them repentance so that they could believe because he said he would. If we go back to Genesis 12:3. This is the promise God made to Abraham. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In you the Jewish families of the earth shall be blessed? No. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Here's Isaiah 49.6. 
It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And here's Malachi 1.11. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations and in every place. Incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering for my name will be great among the nations says the Lord of hosts. What God was doing with the Gentiles was the very thing he had promised to do from the very beginning, even of the founding of Israel. It's like he was saying over and over again to them, you know, the Messiah isn't just for you. The Messiah is going to be for everybody. And here they are being reminded of that by Peter, by Cornelius, by God, by the Spirit by the work that God was doing in their midst. And then we're reminded that when we see God working, we should respond to God's work with praise. Acts 11, 18, when they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. We need to praise when people come into the kingdom. Uh, Reminds me what Jesus said in Luke 15, 7. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And some look at this and they say, well, that God's happier when a person comes to know him than he is to have a person in the church already following him. I don't necessarily believe that to be true. I think what Jesus is saying here is that, you know, there are an awful lot of people out there who think they're righteous and don't have any need of God. God doesn't have time for them. God cares about the one who knows he's unrighteous and needs a Savior. And we need to praise just like the angels in heaven do when that one person comes to repentance, when God grants repentance to that person so that they can turn to him, turn from their sin and turn to him because that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about salvation We're talking about people coming to know God, believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, coming to the realization that they have done wrong in God's sight and deserve punishment and an eternity away from God as a result of their sin. But God, out of his love and his care and his compassion, sent Jesus to die on the cross for them so that they could be forgiven, so that they could know him so that they could have everlasting life. What they have to do, what we have to do, is just say, God, I know I've done wrong. I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Forgive me and welcome me into into your kingdom. And he does. That's what the rejoicing here is. That, okay, it's not just Jews. It's everybody. Everybody. And when we hear reports about God working around the world, we should rejoice. Because he is saving his people. So, we see the gospel here being affirmed by the leadership back in Jerusalem, but we also see something else happening within the church. We're seeing Antioch become the missionary hub, if you will, of the gospel. And we're going to see this, uh, how Paul is sent out and goes on various missionary journeys. The focus, in a very real way, begins to go away from Jerusalem into Antioch in the book, even though we end up back at Jerusalem for this very issue yet again. And you might say, well, I thought it's resolved here now. Doesn't the church believe that, yes, the gospel is for Gentiles? Oh yeah, but the circumcision party isn't just going to go down without a fight. They're 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 going to insist on talking about this more and to the point where, now, this is just kind of Almost as an aside, you think. There's actually an official document going to go out later on in Acts that says, um, don't pay any attention to the circumcision party. They don't know what they're talking about. Now, that's my paraphrase, okay? But that's the general gist of it, okay? We have the Jerusalem Council, and they send out a letter and basically say, yeah, hey, you know what? Gentiles can be saved, and they don't have to keep the law. Exactly what we see here. Well, anyway, when when we talk about Antioch, Um, It's the capital of the province of Syria. It's called Antioch the Beautiful in some of the ancient writings because of the fine buildings. It had a long paved street with double colonnades and trees and fountains. It was a very, uh, very pretty and developed business district. In fact, it probably had up to half a million people there. 
um, anywhere from 300,000 to 500,000. It was considered the third city of the Roman Empire. There was Rome, there was Alexandria, and then there was Antioch. It was a place where a lot of um, religions were, um, lots of temples, temples to Zeus and Apollo, Poseidon, Adonis, uh, Tiki, which I think, why throw that in there? Because it's kind of interesting, that's the god of luck. And um, so you might probably have heard of the others, but then yet another one worshipped there. And there was also a large colony of Jews. So lots of different religions, as well as lots of different people from lots of different places. It was cosmopolitan. In fact, there were a lot of people there from even Persia and India and China. So many that it was called the Queen of the East. And John Stott says this about the city of Antioch in the message of Acts. This new outreach took place in Antioch, Luke tells us, and no more appropriate place could be imagined either as the venue for the first international church or as the springboard for the worldwide Christian mission. So here we see a bit of a focus change from Jerusalem to Antioch, from like the, the, the heart of where the gospel first went out to the place where people are being sent out by the church to share the gospel with others. And one of the things we see right away is that um, our anonymity doesn't affect God's work. And you might be surprised to, 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 to know that based on the way people self-promote in our day and age and the way people present themselves on TV and on programs and, you know, send me your money and not somebody else. But listen to this, Acts eleven nineteen. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch speaking the word to no one except Jews. And yet, and yet, we find Gentiles, Hellenists, becoming believers here in Antioch. And we find here that, that even though their intention was, oh, well, we're going to go out and speak to Jewish people, others are getting saved. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that that these people aren't named. They're just, oh, they got, they got run out of town because of persecution. They were scared for their lives. They went other places. But as they went other places, they couldn't stop talking about Jesus to the point that it wasn't just Jews who believed, it was Greeks as well. That's pretty amazing. But that should tell us something about the way our faith is supposed to be and the fervorness of our faith. The fervor of our faith, I should say. You know, even, even perhaps when we're running for our lives, we, shouldn't be, we, 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 we should have to talk about Jesus because of what's inside. So here are people, just random people, any people, running away from Jerusalem trying to save themselves, but they can't shut up about Jesus Christ. Pretty amazing. But I think there's an important lesson for us there, that it doesn't have to be. Um, a, a well-known ministry. It doesn't have to be a preacher on TV. It doesn't have to be somebody who's lauded in a congregation. Oh, it can be anybody, anywhere, anytime, because when we know God and we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, that should cause us to tell others about Him and about what He has done for us through Jesus. Uh, Paul says this in Romans 15, 17, 18. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. And why this is so important? What does Paul say here about his ministry? Does Paul say, it's all about me? No, he says it's all about Jesus. And here is Psalm 115.1, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. It's got to always be about God. We have to give God the glory. And even when we're talking about our ministry or what God's doing in our church, it has to be that way, what God is doing in our church. And I, I do think it's kind of ironic that there are so many people and organizations and churches and programs out there that say, well, this is what we used at our church in order to do this, and if you just do this, you'll be able to grow in your church too. And like, well, where's God in the midst of all that? Where's the recognition of God? Where's the acknowledgement of God? Where's the focus on God? And we have to be careful of that in all that we do. 
that it's not about us. It's not how wonderful we are. It's about God working through us. And if we're blessed enough to have God working through us, that's pretty amazing. And we need to put aside our pride. Yeah, we may be doing some right. Or yeah, an organization of ministry might be doing some things right. But they wouldn't get anywhere if it weren't for God's Holy Spirit working through them, working in them, working in the hearts and lives of others who are not yet believers yet. The Holy Spirit is who convicts the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. So it can't be about a person. It can't even be about a ministry. It has to always be about God. And I think we also see that Christians should be investigative journalists. Um, I, I know, it's kind of, a journalist has kind of got a bad name these days. I know, I know. But there, there have been some good ones, and there continue to be some good ones. And the good ones look into things and are fair and look at both sides. Acts 11.22, the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. So they got a report from Peter, okay, all well and good. But now they got what's going on up at Antioch, it's not just Jews, there's more Gentiles. You know, let's let's find out what's going on there. Let's send Barnabas to investigate. And they aren't necessarily wrong in doing that. I I think when when we do praise for what God is doing, we have some confidence that it is God doing the work. And that's what the church was rejoicing because they trusted Peter. They trusted Peter's report. They trusted Peter's uh, vision. They understood that Peter had changed drastically because he didn't want to eat from what God was showing him. Because he said, I'm a Jew, I haven't touched anything unclean in my life. That tells us right there that he wouldn't just go and eat with a Gentile. But yet, all of that changed. What changed, Peter? Well, let me tell you what changed. I not only understood I could eat this food, but I understood that I could be with people who ate this food. And I could talk to them, I could share the gospel, and they could believe. Pretty amazing when you think about it, the change in Peter. But now, now they got a report up in Antioch. Well, let's send somebody to see what's going on there. And I say it's not a bad thing because we're told repeatedly in Scripture to be careful. Uh, 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 through 21, Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. This is the church doing what the church should do. And, and, and checking it out to make sure that, that what they're hearing is true. They want a first-hand account of what is going on in Antioch. And Barnabas is a great one. Barnabas is the one who helped Paul at the beginning. He's, he's an encourager, and he ends up encouraging them there. And let me say this. There may be a gift of spiritual encouragement. Okay, And, and, the, and it goes to... Um, uh, well, here, let me read Acts 11.23 first. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. He encourages them. I say there may be a gift of spiritual encouragement because of Romans 12.8, talking about spiritual gifts. Here, there we read, the one who exhorts is supposed to rejoice in his exhortation. The one who contributes and excel. The one who exhorts is, excels in his exhortation. The one who contributes excels in generosity. The one who leads excels with a zeal. The one who does acts of mercy does them cheerfully. So here the gift of exhortation is listed. But in reality, and, and some points say that, well, that's a, that's a part of a preaching ministry there, the exhortation. But in reality, we have the same word used in 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So while some might say, well, there may or may not be a spiritual gift of encouragement, I say there probably is a spiritual gift of encouragement. There are some people that that is just what they do, and they are good at it, and they help, and they encourage others, and they build people up. Um, But I would also say that as everyday believers, there are qualities that help us to be encouragers. Because Barnabas was a good man full of the Holy Spirit, and of faith. And what does that mean then, full of Holy Spirit and faith? Well, I think it means they exhibited the qualities of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. 
And, I might, and what, I, what I want to get at is this, because I think it's vitally important for us as a church and as a body of believers, okay? is that while there may be a spiritual gift of encouragement, that isn't permission for you to be a curmudgeon. Okay? Just, oh, well, I don't have that gift. Really? Well, but you have the fruit of the Spirit, right? If you have the fruit of the Spirit, then you should naturally be encouraging even if you don't have the spiritual gift of encouragement. And when we allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us and we try and follow God and do what he would say, I think we're naturally then encouragers. And when we aren't following God the way we should, I think we go back into that curmudgingly phase and we, we begin to see things wrong everywhere we look and we can never rejoice in what is good and right because we're always finding fault. So don't say, well, I don't have the spiritual gift of encouragement. We're supposed to be by nature encouragers because we have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And we also see here the church has a duty to teach. Acts 11, 24 through 26. And a great many were added to the Lord, so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. Um, the, Barnabas is like, great, we have new believers. What do we do with them? Well, we have to teach them. I mean, that, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's what the church is supposed to be doing. And we see that as a part of the Great Commission in Matthew 20, uh, 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We are not only supposed to share the gospel, we have to make sure that we teach about God, about Jesus, teach people how to live um, uh, Paul told a young minister that this is what he was supposed to be about. Teach and urge these things. 1 Timothy 6, 2-4. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. Church has to be about teaching. It's vital it's essential, and that's why I think that the investigative journalist idea is so important, that when, when you find somebody who is teaching, you have to make sure they're teaching the truth, and each church needs to make sure that they are teaching the truth, because to do other is to rebel against God and to be a false prophet. And here we see also that conversion leads to change. Acts eleven twenty six, and in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. This, for people who want to say, well, why, why do you call yourself Christians? Why should you call yourself Christians? Maybe you shouldn't call yourself Christians anymore. Maybe you should call yourself uh, disciples. Maybe you should call yourself something else. The term Christian has negative connotations with it. Well, that, that's probably true, but that was probably true back then, too, actually. Uh, I'm guessing that they were called Christians. That doesn't sound like they called themselves Christians, necessarily. Sounded like this was a term used by others on the outside because they were different. They were distinct. They weren't Jews. They weren't Greeks. They kept talking about this person named Jesus Christ and insisting he was the way, the truth, and the life. Now, who would do that? Who would say there's only one way to God? There's a temple to Zeus over there. There's a temple to Apollo over there. They can go to any of those. And you're, you're putting down the people that go to those. What, what, why are you just talking about this one person, one way to God? So I don't necessarily think that this was positive to be called a Christian. I, I think it's probably very likely it was negative because they insisted on one way, which meant that they, by virtue, were putting down the other ways to God. And I'm, I, I can't, I mean, I'm sorry to say this, but the Pope's comments notwithstanding. You know, and I'm sure you probably heard about that, where the Pope talked to some, was talking to some children uh, overseas, and he says, oh, we, we have Buddhists, and we have, um, we have Muslims, and we have Christians, and, you know, there are just many ways to God. Now, there's some that are trying to walk that back now, what he said. But that's pretty plain. And it's wrong, absolutely wrong. It's one way to God. One way to God. And that's Jesus Christ. 
And, you know, not only would the Christians be proclaiming that, they would probably also be living a little differently. Um, Ephesians 4, 17, Paul says this, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. So they have a new perspective. They have the Spirit living inside of them. They're going to proclaim the truth about Jesus, and they're going to live a little differently than everyone else. And we, we see that in some of the, some of the times when, um, later on in the book of Acts, when people become believers, they're going to go ahead and get rid of their idols, and, and sometimes the business people of the community get upset because they're making their money with those idols, and they bring about all kinds of accusations and try and get the people riled up against the believers, against the Christians. So I think that being called a Christian isn't necessarily... A good thing because, well, well let, me, let me be careful I say that. We think a Christian maybe is a name of a badge of honor, but here it's being imposed on the outside. For the people on the outside, they might be thinking very negative things about the Christian community. But you know what? That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, we should try and let our good deeds be seen by those around us so they will glorify God in heaven. But you know what? Some of those good deeds people aren't going to understand. Um, you know, you, you stand up for the rights of the unborn. People in this world aren't going to understand that. You stand up for biblical morality when it comes to sexuality and the idea that there are men and women, and, and people don't like that either. Does it mean you shouldn't believe that? No. And if people misunderstand, there's nothing we can do about that. Now, we can try and be as nice and as gentle and as understanding and as caring as possible while standing up for the truth. But many people don't even like it when, just like back then, we say Jesus is the way. The way. Who'd have thought you'd hear a pope say that Jesus isn't the only way? It's a weird world. And the term Christian isn't always going to be a term of endearment to people. And I don't know that it was here. In fact, the only other time Christian is used in the New Testament is 1 Peter 4, 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So here's kind of the same idea, right? You're suffering as a Christian. This is the name imposed by those on the outside. Because you're different, because you believe different, because you think different, because you dare to proclaim that Jesus is the way, you know what? If you suffer for that, glorify God. Glorify God because you're living the way you're supposed to live. And then finally, conversion leads to compassion. Uh, here's the end of our passage, Acts 11, 27 through 30. Now in th these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, and they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Now, first of all, we might look at this and think, oh, prophet, now that's interesting. Are there prophets today? Is there an office of a prophet? Is there a person who can be a prophet? Well, I, I think in answering that, let me go back to apostles first. I think there's a significant amount of evidence that makes me believe that the, the, the office of apostle was for the early church, and there was a gift of apostleship that carried certain things with it. So I, I think that that is no longer, okay? I don't think there are apostles. I think we have the apostles that are revealed to us in the New Testament that, that carry the church forward, that help give us the Bible, help to, help to, to understand who Jesus Christ is and what he did for us, but the office of apostle is no more. Um, what about then, could we still have prophets? Well, some say, no, we don't have prophets in the same sense anymore because we have the word of God now and we rely on the word of God. Um, some say that, no, the office of prophet went away just like the office of apostle did. Some say that ministers are prophets, not that we necessarily tell the future, foretell, but we foretell. We tell people what God says through his word. So we're communicating the words of God. So ministers are prophets. I would never go that far about my own ministry, just, just in case you're wondering. And maybe, maybe some of it's true, maybe it's not. Um, I, I would say this, 
God can still use his spirit to reveal a truth to a person, to a church, to a congregation, and to the world. It doesn't necessarily mean that he singles out one person to be a prophet, but his spirit can use somebody to speak, say, a prophetic truth. But we have to understand that there are some guidelines with that. What the person says can't contradict the word of God. What the person says must be true. Um, And the problem with, and, and here's my biggest concern with prophets. The problem is that with so many self-proclaimed prophets today is they sometimes say things that contradict the word of God. Sometimes they claim something is going to happen and it doesn't happen. Um, That happens an awful lot. Um, Some are a little more cagey and they've learned from past mistakes. And they're so vague they're to the point of being useless. Okay, they want to say, oh, this is some important prophetic truth, and it doesn't really sound like some important prophetic truth. It sounds like they're just trying to cover their own behinds. But anyway, what we find here, though, that I think is most important, I just want to talk about Alpha as a prophet for a minute. It's like, it's like a miracle. Okay, let me put it that way. Um, I don't think God imbues somebody with the gift of being able to do miracles, but God can do miracles. Can God use someone's prayer to perform a miracle? Sure. Could God use somebody to say some sort of prophetic truth? Sure. Do I think there's a prophet or a miracle worker walking around among us? No. I think we, the, the challenge to us is to realize that God does this through his spirit whenever he wants, with whoever he wants, and we don't glorify a particular individual because of something that has happened as a result of their ministry or their work for God. But what we find happening here in response to a truth from God is the church responding and showing compassion, which is what a church is supposed to do. Okay? Um, going to Colossians 3.12, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Here we see the church recognizing that there's a need somewhere else and they are responding to it. Yes, it happens. It happens here because of the prophetic word that God gives to a prophet, but you know it can happen just by somebody sharing with us that somebody has a care down the uh, down the road or somebody has a concern overseas. I mean, I we're, Valerie and I we're, we're, we sponsor a child through Compassion. Compassion is continually reminding us that we can provide help and hope to people around the world. How do we respond? Hopefully, we respond with compassion. And I think there's probably no better way to end what we've been talking about this morning but to continue on from Colossians 3.12. Because this is a reminder. This is what a church does. This is what a church is. And that is kind of what we've been talking about. How, how, how the early church is developing here in Acts. Well, here we have a more fleshed out version of what the church is. Colossians 3.12 Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. You mean their complaints? Oh yeah, haven't we covered that already? And above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you are called in one body. Here's the idea of the Spirit guiding God's people and helping them to to be the church and to get along with one another and gifting people. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. There's the teaching function of the church. In all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. There's the praise. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to the God the Father through him. There's the humility. It's not about us. It's all about God. Let's go to him in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us today. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us to apply this to our lives, to be this way in the church, but also to be this way as individuals. Um, Loving you, relying upon you, looking at your word, praising your name for the work that is done, and not seeking our own glory, but in all that we do, seeking your glory and the glory due your name. And it is your Son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.